Many of you know all of these people already. So Zeming, Will, and Alex were students in the class last semester and are TAs this semester. For their project last semester, they took on the very ambitious task of actually building a kernel in Rust, starting from a very simple Rust boot that was available, turning that into a kernel that actually works on an emulator ARM processor and can do things like have the echo shell that you're starting with for problem set four. So I'm going to hand things over to them, and I think Samin is going to start. All right, hi guys. Um, so we decided to do a kernel for our project last year. Um, so what do you what do you start when you want to build a kernel? You want something that sort of works. You want something that compiles into an emulator. You want something that displays an output. Uh, um, an output. So we started off by. Google searching for existing kernels to see how far people have gotten, and we found Rust Boot, which was a very simple kernel. It didn't compile because it was using an old version of Rust, and so we decided to uh, try to get that working for QEMU, which is an emulator, and specifically using the ARM hardware. And um, to give an overview of this process, about two weeks of it was spent trying to get the actual kernel to boot and to have something printing to the screen. A lot of the issues was trying to find the magic numbers for where memory addresses were and trying to find the right toolchain to use to build our kernel in the first place. And so Will is going to start off by talking about the toolchain and we're just gonna continue with about an overview of how our progress through the kernel and where you will be starting at. Getting the toolchain working was the first thing we had to do and quite possibly one of the more most painful things. Just getting Rust boot, which as Ziming said was very simple, it essentially changed the color of the screen and did nothing other than that and that was when it worked. Uh, just getting that to build took us a significant amount of time. In kernel development, you particularly development for a kernel for an architecture that you aren't running on. Uh, you have to set up a cross-compilation toolchain. And uh, let's actually pull up GitHub. So this, uh, this process took us quite a while, because not only do you have to ensure that every element of the toolchain is correct for your architecture, both the architecture you're compiling from and compiling to, but you, you have essentially no, no way to know if it's actually working. A lot of the time it'll say, oh yeah, I linked correctly, and then you'll go to run the executable and it seg faults because the compiler wasn't correct. So there are a lot of variables to consider, and we've done this part for you. You should all be applauding us now. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is sort of a look that we put together at what it takes to get the entire GNU cross-compiler toolchain for just ARM. So you have to compile the compiler from source. You can't get, in most cases, a pre-compiled binary. And you have to, while doing this, configure the compiler with some fairly specific information. This one is probably the easiest to understand. We're targeting an ARM architecture. And the non EABI refers to the, the calling and linking convention that the compiler should use. Because different architectures execute code in, in slightly different ways, as you should know if you've taken CompArc, this is very relevant for whether or not something will actually build on the processor you're targeting. And in our case, because this is not a Rust compiler, we're using it for assembly linkage, we had to make sure it would be cross compatible with Rust. The rest of this is mostly for, for that, enabling interwork and enabling multilib to ensure that it will work both on the emulated system and with Rust. So that's mostly what we've given you for this. We haven't given you the full tool chain that we built because you don't need all of it. We had to add some extra debugging tools just to get things off the ground. That was, that was a very significant first step. So next, I think Alex wants to talk about finding magic numbers. So once you have the toolchain configured, you still have to find all the specifics for your architecture. There are several ways you can do this. You can go on the, if you have a specific question, there are IRCs, IRC channels. 
I'll just type them in here so that if you look at the video later, you can actually find them. So the first of these is OSDEV. They're from the OSDEV wiki. And while it's specific to operating systems, they are very knowledgeable about kernel, about kernel specifics and ARM. So if you have questions that are specific, you can ask them here. Otherwise, there's, there's like a Ubuntu ARM developers, one in Arch Linux kernel developers. And then there's the ARM documentation. And there's about, I don't know, maybe 10 different boards you have to choose from. And we're using the versatile PB. Okay, so a lot of these magic numbers, you guys already have them. They will be explained in the code. There's normally a link to the documentation there to explain where they're from and what they do. Most of them, you can change them if you want, but you'll probably say fault. And a lot of those have to do with, like here on this, well, this is for the interrupt table, and that's specifically for keyboard interrupts, which Will's going to talk about. So, like, uh, like we said earlier, Rust Boot was not very capable. Uh, in essence, it could change the color of the screen and do nothing else. So the first thing we wanted to add was making, in essence, an echo kernel, something that can detect your key presses, print them to the screen, and maybe do other fancy things like actually interpret them. And the first step in getting that to work is working with interrupts. So interrupts are handled by essentially putting pointers to functions in an interrupt table in, in this context. <coughs> So we first had to set up a table structure, and we inherited some of the code, some of the assembly here, from Rust Boot to actually load, that, load the interrupt table up. You shouldn't know, need to know ARM assembly for this project. We had to deal with it a little bit, but I think we've made sure all those parts work and you have them, so you should just be working in Rust. But essentially what that's doing is changing the mode of the processor to interrupt request mode, actually loading your IRQ table, and then going back into like normal operation mode. So once we've done that, we have to give, give the interrupt table something to do. We do that here in mod.rs of kernel. So in the initialization code in main, we have created our table here, and what we're doing here is uh, actually giving, the, giving our key press handler to the interrupt table. So if we look at drivers init, which I thought I had open. Oh, uh, yeah, I do. So if we look here, we are taking the, the table from, from the kernel, which is a property of the module. And this map has the effect of kind of unwrapping that table, getting to the object inside on which we're able to call our enable method using the enumeration value for IRQ mode and passing it key press. Key press is a function, so we're passing it a function pointer that essentially just gets the value of a character and sends it to a custom function. This is sort of convoluted, and that's necessitated in part by our desire to let the user set their own key handling function here. So we made it more general than just giving F there. But also in part, uh, and we'll see this again later, by the necessary manner that we have to compile the kernel in. We have to use um, dash O3 in the comp compilation for things to actually work for reasons that we were never quite able to track down, but could definitely replicate. O3 is the first level of optimization in, in LLVM and GCC that does not guarantee that code will have identical operation to an unoptimized version. So this, in particular, it was optimizing out our entire key handling function because it wasn't actually doing anything. It didn't return a value that was used anywhere, so it just got rid of it. That led us to have to do this function direction here. Originally, what had been there was a statement that takes the value of x and just reassigns it right back to uart0, which is completely useless but tricks the compiler into thinking that it shouldn't take it away. So back in the kernel. So we've initialized our table, and now we have to actually give 
a meaningful function to that key down handler, the, the F that it calls in essence. So Ming wants to start talking about that. Um, so just to clarify something that he said earlier, um, URAT, URAT zero here is a spot in memory. Whenever you press a key, essentially you put the character of the key into the spot in memory, and then the kernel will go and read it again and output it back. So essentially, the reason that the compiler thinks that the function does nothing is because all it does is change a spot in memory and then does nothing with the spot in memory. But in actuality, the hardware itself is doing things in memory, so we have to make sure the compiler doesn't optimize that out. So yeah, parse key, the parse feed key function is the one that um, when it sees a key press, it'll well, essentially parse it. And uh, it takes x as the spot in memory that the key press was written to, and it converts it into a u8. The meat of the code is down here in this match statement, which essentially looks at the key code of the character as an ASCII character. Now, um, because this is a kernel, you're not given extra functionalities like backspace and the return key for free. You have to code them yourself. So you have to catch, for example, third is the return key, terminal prompting here, whenever you see the return key, prompt them for a new command. Usually uh, one, so I think there's another key code for backspace, but the ARM hardware actually catches 127 for the backspace key, and so once you see 127, you'll have to delete a character. And for anything else, we haven't implemented it yet, but for example, the up arrow will get a specific sequence of key presses. The up arrows, and the arrow keys specifically are 37 followed by two other key presses. So for example, if you want to implement that whenever you see 37, you'll have to go into some internal state and then catch more key presses until you get to a valid sequence, sort of like a finite state automata. In that way, you can implement other key presses on your keyboard. and. To find these key presses, the easiest thing to do would to just print them out directly. Yeah, and that is what we did. Here down the key code function, it's a very convoluted function uh, to essentially, it takes a mod and then it takes a mod to get the least significant digit and prints it out. You guys know all of that. The other thing that the kernel doesn't give you is the ability to use strings. So all you get is a primitives provided by the Rust compiler, such as character u8, uint. So in order to do something like to use strings, you have to use the memory allocator that was provided to you in this project. The memory allocator uses this buddy block allocation system. Uh, the buddy block allocation system is um, a system where when giving a block in memory, you and you want to allocate a certain amount, you'll keep on having the amount that of the total memory until you can fit it in. And essentially it creates like a binary tree structure from your memory and it'll fit it in the smallest possible power of two that contains the memory that you want to allocate for. Once you allocate a stretch of memory using the allocation system, you'll have to actually make your own string structure which operates on the memory itself instead of any like original function that you might have had in Java or even Rust for string operations. So you have to keep in mind some things like setting the last character of the string to uh, backslash zero or keeping a length attribute on the string and, oh look, here's our iron kernel prompt. Isn't it cool? It's, it's, it's a circle with an R in it. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Yes, it's a Rust logo. Uh, here is our string struct. Um, it keeps a pointer to where the location and memory of the string is, and it keeps where the current location is and the maximum size of the string buffer. After you implemented strings, you'll be able to read in the key codes, save them to a buffer, and then maybe output them and do other more complex things with them. And uh, the, the, nece the necessity for these strings is, is more so a function of the fact that we're using Rust here. By having to decouple Rust from its runtime, we lose a lot of the built-in libraries and things that it gives you. Rust core, uh, which is sort of like a, a standalone library for Rust, 
implement some of these, but at the time we were writing this, it didn't have strings implemented fully or really at all, which, yeah, it still doesn't, which is really why we had to write this. If any of you have run Iron Kernel yet, you'll notice that it pops up two screens. The, oh, hang on, we're going to run it. Okay, there's a QEMU emulator screen, and then there's the prompt. And you actually have to type into the prompt. We, as far as we know, because of how QEMU is set up, uh, you can't intercept any key presses done into this window. It's strange, but that's the way it is. So the typing on the left is all done via just regular prints. Printing in the QEMU emulator requires actually writing to memory. And that requires all this stuff. There's a lot of unexplained constants here. First of these would be why the start address for video is 2 to the 20. We have no idea. Um, that's just what made it work with our ARM board. And all this is specific to board. Again, a lot of them are magic values. We've given you links to where you find them. But you should be spared from having to deal with any of this. The way you go about writing to the screen is you have to initialize a bunch of constants depending on your resolution. All these numbers here, they're magic values provided by the ARM documentation. One thing you have to be careful about when writing directly to any location in memory is whether you want to like set a flag or actually write a value. So we have, we have two functions for doing that. You have to keep in mind that if you're setting a flag, you don't want to clear whatever is there before it. So you just or the value instead of doing a hard set. And then when you're actually writing, you can do a hard set. Um, so that's so when we're setting all the initial, initial values, we have to or. I think it actually turns out that for most of these, if you just replace the value, you end up being OK. But then every time you draw, you have to fill the background. You have to refresh the background. Um, you keep a cursor where you currently are. And then you just have to make sure. So the cursor is going to be the last thing you draw, and then it draws in, lo in levels. The rest of drawing um, to the screen with characters is mostly handling edge cases, like what happens when you want to go off the screen or when you actually need more space, and, or backspace, restore. Um, and this is all done just by saving what you've seen and keeping it in a separate array somewhere, then drawing it as needed. That's really the bulk of screenwriting. OK, so um, when you're compiling with uh, Rusty, there will, I'm trying to find an example. OK, so if you have code like this, because you're including handcrafted assembly, the Rust compiler will not optimize that block of code, which is good and bad. The good thing about it is that if you don't include that, there are, I can't find a place right now, but there are some places in the code where we would actually like be optimizing out entire functions and files that we called, because the compiler couldn't tell it was doing anything. So if that ever starts happening in your code, the way to fix that is to do an empty ASM call, which means you basically include an ASM directive and then just empty quotes. OK, so it would be like this one here. Otherwise, the compiler will optimize out putting a character to the screen. And then you just have to be careful that you're on the right documentation version. And QEMU has a nasty habit of, instead of gracefully exiting when there's an error, it will actually hang and freeze your terminal. You can just kill the terminal and restart there, and you'll be fine. One other thing to note that you might have seen in some of this code, and I think there's an example in interrupt, is the use of this attribute no mangle. Name mangling is a way that compilers handle object-oriented programming, specifically with overloaded functions, whereby they make the name of the function not just debug, but something like interrupt, debug, unsafe, uh, void, or something like that. They basically they change the name that you've given it. Now. This can also have the effect of making it harder and possible to link to that function. So for functions that you need to pass around as pointers, you should tag those with no mangle. Specifically, I think we did that for the, the key handler, as well as this debug function, to, to make you, it possible to, say, put it into the interrupt table or do something like that. So that's, I think, all we have. What questions can we answer for you? or fail to answer. <laughs>